Yeah, Mark, how, how do you see this uh, in, in, in your clinic situation, if that would be possible one day? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I agree completely with uh, Mazda. I mean, things have to go away from the way we're traditionally doing it. I, there's a couple short shortcomings in how we do things now. One is that a lot of what we do is based on, on a a decision by a primary care physician to refer somebody and that often is is based on abnormal liver tests or just some some variable uh that they might be interested in, in following and typically follow for liver disease however these type of programs especially if you can integrate them into emrs uh, so me electronic medical records and and so that it, and it's being done automatically in the background um, uh, it, it provides an opportunity for primary care physicians to really identify people where these people live, essentially, which is in primary care, uh, and, and then pick out the ones that are actually the ones that we're most concerned with from a liver point of view, or it doesn't have to be liver, because of course, all these type of programming, you can program just to identify people at cardiovascular risk, at a risk of developing, a higher risk of developing diabetes, There's all of these different things you could program into there. And so it's actually a I guess a way of thinking about uh, about uh, using a a a, a, a uh, uh, algorithms within a computer based system to to drive directing patients in the right way so they get to see the right people uh, and so I think that that's going to be a huge thing because the problem is most of these patients are missed I mean if it's twenty five percent of the adult population has NAFLD uh, and two to three percent has NASH I mean no nowhere near that number are being evaluated for liver disease and, and we all know that there's this huge group of people out there that are that I think primary care physicians and many physicians don't really know how to approach them so this gives a tool especially if it's simple like an app is great if it's embedded in the EMR, it's even better because then it doesn't even require thinking. It just comes out and flags patients and saying, you need to be concerned about this patient potentially or this sort of thing. I think that empowers family doctors and physicians in general to really, I think, think about people's liver disease uh, when they might not be thinking at all about their liver disease, actually. It doesn't even come into their sort of day-to-day -day thinking. They're busy, they have busy practices and, and you know, when you think of two to three percent of people have not, uh, NASH, I mean that's, and then there's going to be a subgroup of those that are going to progress to serious liver disease. I mean, a, a lot of a lot of uh, physicians aren't going to spend a lot of time thinking about that because they're worried about the more common things that are coming into their clinic, and so they have a tendency to not necessarily have that on the forefront of their mind that hey, this person has a BMI of 35, they're diabetic. I, you know, I need to be thinking about other things. Our liver tests are abnormal. I've been watching them for the last five years. The platelet count's 130,000, and they don't think that that's liver necessary liver disease. And this is a way of saying man, this person needs to see a specialist. So I think that that's a huge leap forward. And, and then the, the, uh, the second thing is, and I, I'll be, I'm very interested in what Mazin thinks of this, that, I mean, these are, a lot of these are, okay, so we can, we can use these, these type of algorithms to, to find these patients. We can then say, we can then stratify them based on, okay, you're at higher risk or whatever, or you may have this degree of fibrosis already and you're at increased risk over the next five years of progression to cirrhosis, say, so that's, I think that's absolutely critically valuable. The second thing, of course, is that once these medications start coming on the market, a big issue is, is do, these, do these need to be lifelong treatments? So once we start to get into the a course of treating patients, can we use these type of algorithms to predict when people can come off those medications, of course, which has tremendous cost savings with the disease that's so prevalent. And just, I'd be very interested in what Mazin thinks of that as a is that part of the long-term strategy? I'm sure it probably is, but... You know, when you were listening to our conversation just yesterday morning around the same time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we were, uh, I guess, taking it to the next uh, level. Um, as you know, right, right now, like things we talked about, and I'll make a brief, uh, things we talked about now we have, for instance, American Gastroenterology um, Association algorithm that started the FIP4 followed uh, by a fiber scan. So one of the things that uh, we are going to do is to compare these machine learning algorithms uh, to that uh, algorithm. Um, as you know, FIP4 is, is a great start, uh, but it does have a little bit downfalls, if you want to say. It does have, uh, there are data showing that people in the indeterminate and uh, low zone had some clinical liver events eventually. Um, it does not perform as well in, in diabetics. Uh, but the start to, for comparison is just to see how many 
because uh, our cohort has biopsy to see how many FIB4 followed by fibro scan will classify and misclassify compared to these algorithm. So that's the first step. We cannot do outcomes yet. Uh, the second step we talked about uh, yesterday are therapies. So it will be easy to comply, right? We are not asking pharmaceutical companies to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. Just apply the algorithm in your uh, pre and post treatment responders and non-responders and let's see how it looks like. So that will be uh, uh, another step. There are some drugs that we can test it. Um, so um, we probably go to some of these companies. And thirdly, actually, is comparing to outcome, um, which is much harder to do than your regular uh, data sets. So a lot of data sets, uh, they will have between 18, 20, 25 outcomes and the New England Journal paper by the NASCRN had 55 outcome and they, they they were following the patients for so many years and they just got only 55 outcome. Machine learning, they don't, the problem was machine learning, they don't like small numbers. So if someone sends me a paper as a E to review and they did machine learning three, 400 patients, I'll say, wait a minute, there's a problem because the machine is, it will struggle with three, 400. Uh, usually uh, we look for a thousand and beyond samples and for outcomes, uh, 2025 might be uh, an issue unless if you dump some st statistical um, methods where you kind of amplify the outcomes and you cover artificially, it's okay, but it's not as good as when you have the real outcomes. So yeah, um, I, I give you the whole spiel about where we're going. We are going to compare to the current algorithm, importantly, as you said, to see if it's gonna predict a treatment response. And it might not be not the same algorithm changing, it's, it could be a formula that predict changes in the future uh, and looking at outcomes. Um, it sounds a lot of formulas, but again, this is when you have a, you, you want to think about a robot doing the work for you. Uh, <laughs> Not sitting in your office. Or sitting in my uh, office making my espresso. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The perfect robot. The, uh, the, the, uh, I think another powerful thing that Mazen touched on earlier as well is that so many so many different centers now are moving towards epic based uh, EMRs and epic can you can epic is is as I guess is a way of thinking of it's a common language that's going into these machines uh, essentially there the variables there can be uh, you can extract things out of the back end of epic which is like a, a giant uh, an electronic medical record which has all of the different people that contact that patient go into that that healthcare record. And so as we start to get more and more people using Epic and more and more people then collaborate together and Epic is spreading around the world. I mean, we're just uh, undergoing Epic uh, implementation here in Calgary that are doing it in Toronto and Eastern Canada. So, and then in, throughout Europe, it's the biggest sort of EMR in the world, essentially the way of thinking of it. And, and so it gives you an opportunity not only to, to collaborate with multiple centers, mul multiple different ethnic groups, multiple different countries, multiple different healthcare systems, but also it gives you a chance I think to to uh, to just have the numbers can be vast. I think as you start to expand that, and then you can start to when you develop an algorithm, it becomes much easier. I think to test it in those when you have an epic type thing, especially if they're linked centers where people are on the same thinking, the same they want their interest in the same sort of things, where you, you can then apply it into the you with those huge groups of patients. I think it provides a, a, a tremendous opportunity to really shift the whole field forward actually i don't know what do you think about that Mazen? yeah to your point i mean one of the things that we had it we envisioned is um you have the drug approved on the market let's say resmitterone and let's say some i i know you're very savvy in your system and you implemented screening for primary care and all this but a lot of systems have not done that yet and let me take the example, and I'm, I don't know what they did. I, I, I'm not saying they're not doing anything, but let's say Kaiser. And Kaiser all of a sudden is like, hey, I, I, we, we have drugs approved. We want to know how many patients we treat. 
So you can apply FIB4. It's usually going to ask you for F3 and more, and then you're going to have do fiber scan on bunch. But also you can apply the Nash F2 formula and tell you you have 3 million that they need treatment in your system. Uh, and out of those, those that many F2, those that many F3 that you start to have to pay attention to them and you have actually undiscovered cirrhotics that you need to screen them for HCC. So bring them to clinic and 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 look at it. And that can be done in once you apply for formula less than an hour and find out all these patients. Yeah, it's a huge driver. And in fact, it'll, I think it'll be those type of groups that have there's not only do they have a, a, a lot, huge cohort of patients but actually they're they're trying to do the best sort of therapy for the patients but actually in the most cost effective way and so when you have that kind of sort of it's almost like a business it is a business model essentially uh, i think that can really move change because in the end they want to do it cost effectively and so that drives people to look at things differently indeed we're going to definitely have to have another call right at time for this uh, for this particular session but I, I want to thank you for opening our eyes up, Mazin, to, to our future. Um, and uh, I know that uh, we're going to have to do this again because you're going to be learning on your own on top of machine learning. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's incredible. And Mark, thank you, as always, for, uh, for sharing your, your input and insights as well. Really great seeing you again, Mazin. It's all, the, always a pleasure chatting. Same here. We have to do another trip to Europe. But to a safe country this time, uh, Mark. <laughs> thank you for <laughs> thank you for having me, Michael. And uh, it was really a great pleasure. Take care. Have a great day, everyone. Take take care, guys. Bye bye.